Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Ira Silverberg. I'm the Director of Literature at the National Endowment for the Arts. Thank you for joining us for this discussion about The Big Read and our three new titles. To begin, I'd like to welcome our chairman, Rocco Landisman. Rocco? Hi, Ira. Hi, Rocco. I'm so glad you're here. Me too. Does that mean I'm on? That means you're on, and we'd, we'd love to hear what you have to say about The Big Read. Okay, great. Thanks, Ira. Sure. In 2006, the NEA, in partnership with our tremendous colleagues at Arts Midwest, launched the Big Read to provide grants to organizations that provide communities the opportunity to come together around reading and discussing a single book. Over the past six years, the NEA has invested more than $13 million through 949 grants to organizations that have reached nearly 3.4 million Americans. In addition, the Big Read blog, neabigread.org, is read by 2,000 individuals each week. And the audio guides that we have created for each title have been downloaded more than 78,000 times. Since 2009, the Big Read library has remained constant with 31 titles that run from the adventures of Tom Sawyer through A Wizard uh, of Earthsea. Under Ira's leadership, We've expanded the Big Read with three new books that were chosen from a list of more than 500 titles nominated by the public, former Big League grantees, panelists, and staff, and others in the, in the literary community. We then seated a book review committee comprised of William Farley, a college student and 2009 NEA Poetry Out Loud national champion, Jane Gibson, a teen services librarian, Jocelyn Hale, a writer and literary center director, Mitchell Kaplan, a bookseller, Nora Okia Keller, a writer and teacher, Richard Rodriguez, a writer and editor, and Siva Srinivasan, a former publisher. They were tasked with reading and scoring each book based on the universal appeal of its themes, its capacity to incite lively and deep discussion, and whether the book expanded the range of voices and stories currently represented in the Big, Lead, Big Read Library. We also asked them to focus especially on contemporary works by living authors. After all of their work was completed, three titles were the clear choices. Luis Alberto Urea's Into the Beautiful North, Jumpa Lahiri's The Namesake, and Charles Portis's True Grit. And I'm thrilled that we have two of those authors and an expert on the third with us today. So let me turn things back over to Ira so we can get started on today's discussion. Thanks so much. Thank you, Rocco. Before we dive into our discussion, I have a few housekeeping announcements for our listeners. You are all muted and will only be able to hear us. We will have a 20-minute conversation with our authors, then we'll open things up for a Q&A from our listeners. You can submit questions and comments at any time during the discussion by using the Q&A box below the big read backdrop slide. We will do our best to address as many as possible during the time we have. Please do not use the raise hand button. This webinar will be posted on our website in the podcasts, webcasts, and webinars section in a few days, so you can refer to it in the future. Now that that's been taken care of, let's meet our participants. When I joined the NEA as literature director last December, wow, it's been almost a year, I thought it was time to freshen up the Big Read program with new titles by living authors featuring new perspectives and stories which reflect the wonderful diversity in American culture. That said, today I'm thrilled to introduce Jhumpa Lahiri, a Pulitzer Prize winning writer, a former NEA Creative Writing Fellow in Prose, and member of the President's Committee on the Arts and, and the Humanities. Her novel, The Namesake, which was also made into a film by Mira Nair, follows the Ganguly family from their traditional life in Calcutta through their fraught transformation into Americans. On the heels of an arranged marriage, Ashok and Ashima Ganguly settle in Cambridge, Massachusetts, where Ashok does his best to adapt while his wife longs for her family and her homeland. When their son, Gogol, is born, the job of naming him betrays their hope of respecting old customs in a new world. Also joining us today is Luis Urea, 
best-selling author of 13 books, member of the Latino Literature Hall of Fame, and a 2005 Pulitzer Prize finalist for nonfiction. His novel, Into the Beautiful North, tells the story of Nayeli, a 19-year-old living in the Mexican town of Tres Camarones, who spends her days serving tacos and dreaming about her father, who journeyed to the United States to find work. One day, it dawns on Nayeli that he isn't the only man who's left town. In fact, there are almost no men in the village. They've all gone north, leaving Tres Camarones at the mercy of bandidos. Inspired by a screening of The Magnificent Seven, Nayeli decides to go north herself and recruit her own Siete Magnificoso to repopulate and protect her hometown. And finally, we're joined by Dr. Carlo Rotella. Dr. Rotella is the director of Ameri the American Studies Program and director of the Lowell Humanities Series at Boston College. He has held Guggenheim, Howard, Du Bois Fellowships and received the Whiting Writers Award and the American Scholars Prize for Best Essay and Best Work by a Younger Writer. He is an expert on the life and work of Charles Portis and will speak today about the novel True Grit, which chronicles the journey of young Maddie Ross as she sets out to avenge the death of her father at the hands of a drifter named Tom Cheney. Maddie is joined by the one-eyed marshal Rooster Cogburn and LeBeouf, a Texas Ranger with a mean cow lick. Welcome, Carlo, Luis, and Jumpa. We're delighted to host you today. Hi. Um, hi. Hi, everyone. Hi. So ev is everyone signed on? We're all there? Yeah, we're here. Very good. Thank you all so much. Thank you for taking the time. Thank you for being here. Um, I'm going to start with one question, which I hope you will all answer. But Luis, having a little bit more experience with our Big Read program, I'm, I'm going to go to you, Luis. You, as you know, this, this program brings communities together around the discussion of a particular book. What do you look forward to with having your novel as part of the Big Read? Uh, you know, I've... I've been lucky enough to do some things with the Big Read, you know, representing Rudy and Naya in a couple of places when he couldn't go. And, uh, you know, it's so exciting to see communities come together. It's so exciting to see books come to life in so many hands. And, you know, I, I really love the chance to to take the uh, immigration debate and the identity concerns in the country into a new arena, you know, with a new way to discuss it with people. That, that's fantastic. Thank you, Luis. Chimpa, I know you've done programs like this before, and I wonder what you hope for uh, having the namesake as part of the Big Read. Well, first, I just would like to say I am so deeply honored to be part of this and to be part of the incredible collection of books that have been chosen by the Big Read. Um, I, I think... What strikes me is that, just from a personal perspective, you know, when I was when I was writing the novel, I never thought about it as as being part of a larger dialogue, and I think that was my own innocence, my own unawareness at the time that that what I was trying to articulate was in in some sense, uh, an American story, given that the experience of my upbringing seemed so um, alienated from what I perceived as a child and as, a, as an adolescent to be the American experience. And, and then I wrote the book, and it was published, and then I began to sort of receive reactions to the book, only to realize that it it is a part of the American experience. And that was a revelation for me after the fact, after writing the book. And, and now that it's been about a decade since I wrote the book and, and, uh, and I've had the, the, the opportunity to have some distance and perspective and now to be a part of this discussion, it makes me realize how even as we're in the, in the middle of trying to understand something about ourselves about the world we're still we can still be quite in the dark and then only to 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 understand in retrospect that it's not what we thought it was and so 
in what I'm really grateful for is that the book is is a part of this conversation and and that in a sort of retroactive way it makes me feel uh, less estranged from the country that I was brought up in and that that's really a very uh, wonderful feeling I, I must say it, that's that's very powerful thank you Carlo how do you hope communities will benefit from reading Charles Portis's True Grit? Well, you know, a True Grit is one of those books that uh, snares a lot of people uh, when they're, you know, uh, teens or young adults. I first read it in seventh grade, and and I've been rereading it, you know, every other year since then. Um, and and I I think you know it takes a very familiar kind of a story. It's a western, and in fact, it's a revenge western, um, and elevates it mostly through its use of voice. You know, the voice of this. Uh, 14-year-old girl, although in fact it's the voice of the 64-year-old woman uh, she's become who's looking back on what turned out to be sort of bittersweetly the great adventure of her life. So, you know, I, I read it with all the excitement of, of a kid, you know, discovering another kid off on a great adventure when I was, you know, roughly Maddie's age, and I'm, I reread it, and as I'm getting closer to the age that, you know, Maddie is when she's actually narrating the story, looking back on her life. You know, you just become more and more aware of the layers in it, and 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 Portis's achievement in in in, in um, taking this character seriously, but also not losing a sense of humor about her. Um, she's in some ways, you know, amazing and brave and 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 intrepid, and in other ways, you know, an annoying 14-year-old who's really uh, tight with a dollar and uh, and won't give up and pesters adults, and and that that kind of the the layering of that character and the appreciation of that character, especially as my daughters approach that age. Um, is the kind of thing that, you know, it, it's a book to reread, um, and it's a book to really appreciate, especially the way he takes a kind of a, a regular guy, regular gal voice, someone who's not rich or famous or particularly educated, and elevates it to epic without ever losing a sense of humor. Uh, I thank you, and I, I love your love of Maddie through the ages. I think, I think that's great. Champa, in your novel, The Mother, Ashima Ganguli, works in a library. And Luis, in your novel, The Librarian in Kankakee, plays a very important role. I'm wondering if each of you could address the role that libraries have played in your lives. I am happy to start, if that's OK. That would be lovely. Um, well, where to begin? Um, first and foremost, I'm the daughter of a librarian. My father is um, at the age of 81 today, still uh, working full time in the cataloging department of the University of Rhode Island. Um, that has been my family's reason for coming, being in America. He, he first, we first came, um, his first job was at the library at MIT um, for a couple of years, but then since 1970, he's been with the URI library, um, that's what I knew of America. That was the, 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 the legitimate link, the only legitimate link, it seemed uh, to me as a child, was that my father was a librarian in America. Um, in addition, I can just, would like to share a couple of things. Um, the first house I remember living in, in the United States, in, in Rhode Island, was about a two-minute walk from the public library in our town in Kingston, Rhode Island. And one of my most fundamental early memories was of attending the children's story hour in that library. And I remember that it was a lifeline for, for me as a child who was brought up in a Bengali-speaking household, but who was being sent to school in, in a small town in Rhode Island and being educated entirely in English. And, and those two worlds had absolutely nothing to do with one another. And I felt um, not, I felt in place in neither world from a very early age. But the one place I did feel at home and utterly excited and happy and content always was in that public library listening to stories and being read to. I eventually uh, went on as a high school student and college student to work 
in that library. It was my goal in life as a, as a young girl to work in, in that library. And I was fortunate enough to be offered a job for a few years as a page and, you know, checking out books and shelving books and dusting the books and that sort of thing. Um, and then I did work in some college libraries eventually when I was older. But, um, I mean, I would just, to be brief, say that uh, libraries are um, in my blood. It's my, my DNA. It's my, it's my true north. It's my, you know, libraries are what I have in my life in, in place of a church or a temple. Um, and, you know, I don't know. I don't know what more to add. Um, but uh, I just wanted to share that, That's great. Thank you. And as I recall, you were actually involved with your own local library. I feel like I saw you. Uh, were you not on the, the board of the Brooklyn Public Library at some point? I know. I, a couple of things in, the, in recent years. Um, I mean, I, I try to read at libraries whenever and wherever I can uh, because I believe so strongly in them. I think they're the perfect democratic institution and just the highest form of civilization, frankly. Um, so I, I try to do whatever I can in terms of promoting libraries, um, drawing people to libraries. I also um, created a library at my children's school in Brooklyn, which was a sort of... Um, strange and lovely dream that came true because my, my children attended a school, attend a school that uh, is a new school, uh, relatively new school, and, and, and started really from the ground up with the bare bones, teachers and students, and has slowly added the, the bells and whistles. And one of the bells and whistles that seemed to be, to me, to be missing was a library. And so one of the other parents at the school and I sat down and literally started collecting books and cardboard boxes and, you know, ordering the supplies and the plastic jackets and typing a card catalog on a Word document and launching a library out of a tiny, tiny room with two bookcases from Ikea. But it was just the most wonderful and satisfying thing because of, of the reaction that I perceived, that I, that I experienced when those kids, six and seven and eight years old, first entered that tiny room with those two IKEA bookshelves and realized that there was a, a little room in their little school with a collection of books that belonged to them. It's fantastic. Such an amazing thing. I, I, I can't tell you, you know, it was really, you know, it just reaffirmed my, my, my love and my devotion and my respect for libraries. Thank you. Luis, Ira, do tell. You and the librarian. <laughs> um, your li the librarian in your novel plays an important role. So, uh, what roles? What role have librarians played in your life? Or um, t tell us about your feelings. Well, I, I grew up in a place with no library, and uh, in fact, they just fairly recently got a library, and I was unbelievably thrilled to go back to the barrio and do a, a reading there it was really a transformative moment for me but not having a library and not having much money um you know i, I felt in this place uh, sort of culturally starved and i used to go on saturdays with my mother and take two or three buses to downtown san diego to the uh, city library down there and my mother was wise enough to get me uh, a, my junior card and I could get seven books at a shot. And uh, so it became this ritual. How quickly did you go through them? Fast. <laughs> I couldn't stop myself. But, um, you know, it, it, uh, it, it became a kind of a literacy ritual. We would take the buses and go downtown San Diego and always go to Woolworths, and I would look at the parakeets, <laughs> and we would get a hot dog, and then we'd go to this magical place, the library. And I'd lose myself in there for quite a long time. And then I'd go home with a stack of books. And I was a rich boy every weekend doing it. And, um, you know, later with that Kankakee library in my novel, that librarian was a, a real person. And I, uh, she passed away uh, in the library 
And uh, I thought it would be really nice to try to honor her as a character. And I was deeply moved when the Into the Beautiful North came out that Kankakee uh, did Mary Jo Days in honor of her, and they started a, 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 a benefit in her name to put people, you know, to give them scholarships to go to college. So, you know, librarians are superheroes, and uh, they don't have to wear capes, and they don't have to have Batmobiles. They they change lives and save lives. And, you know, I have to say, if not for those little Woolworths days on Saturdays downtown San Diego, I might not have written a book. So. That, that's fantastic. Thank you. Before I ask Carlo a question, uh, I just want to ask our listeners if you would be interested in submitting questions. And if the answer is yes, you can type them into the Q&A box. So Carlo, uh, let me ask. I know you've had the rare privilege of meeting and talking to Charles Portis, who is perhaps one of the most reclusive American writers. I wonder if you um, have talked to him about the difficulties and pleasures of inhabiting the very, very particular voice of Maddie. Um, True Grit is so much about this one person, and it seems like this person is probably so different than he is. And if I could ask you, when you answer that, to speak up and ask our other panelists to speak up as they answer their questions, that would be helpful. Sure. Well, you know, I mean, the, the way Charles Portis inhabits his characters is, is, is the great pleasure and the great mystery of reading him, and not just True Grit, but all of his novels, is that he, he gets so deeply into his characters, and yet he's always just a little bit over their shoulder um, so that you are feeling what they're feeling, and you're also feeling their sense, their worry that, they're, that they appear ridiculous, and, uh, and you're worried for them that they appear ridiculous, but they also sometimes do appear ridiculous, and you can laugh at them in a not particularly cruel way, and it's an amazing accomplishment. And yes, I was looking forward to talking with him about it um, when we met for a drink at Little Rock. He's not reclusive so much as he just doesn't like to talk about writing. He likes to let his writing speak for itself. So he met with me on the condition that we wouldn't talk about his writing or uh, anything connected to his writing. Um, and in, so, with, with whom does he talk about <laughs> his writing? That's a fine question. He's not a recluse. He's got lots of friends, and he's a charming fellow and a great rock and turn. I did get to hear his voice, which is, you know, which, like his characters, is this um, kind of a regular guy voice with this kind of elevated, uh, slightly epic diction. You know, he's led a really interesting life, and... He, he uh, fought in Korea and, and was, uh, he was in a newspaper man in New York and in London. And he told me a, a story about going to visit the set of the first True Grit, the first adaptation of True Grit, the one that starred John Wayne. And, um, th and he, he told me a story about John Wayne being, uh, being kind of cold and distant to him when they met, which he thought was odd. And then afterwards, someone who, uh, who knew uh, John Wayne mentioned that um, it, it was because uh, Wayne thought that Portis being a writer would have a problem with John Wayne's uh, right-wing politics, and Portis made sure that I understood that he would not have had a problem with John Wayne's right-wing politics. But in fact, the real reason, it turns out, uh, somebody else explained, is because uh, Portis was in the Marines and did fight in the war, and John Wayne had just pretended to, and he was intimidated. Um, and what he was intimidated by was this kind of laconic, um, easygoing, tail-spinning, uh, sort of uh, classic middle American uh, character with enormous confidence in the stories he tells and the characters he inhabits, and it and it and it it is deeply impressive. But no, he wouldn't talk with me about it. He just he he prefers to just leave it at the office. He, he sounds not here today. <laughs> yeah, no, he sounds like a great character. But I thank you for channeling him in in your own way, Chimpa. You've said of the namesake, America is a real presence in the book. The characters must struggle and come to terms with what it means to live here, to be brought up here, to belong and not belong here. That tension for Gogol, um, do you feel like he finally reconciles belonging and not belonging? Well... I don't know if it can be called a reconciliation, which implies some sort of acceptance of the state, I suppose, yeah. Solution. But I think, yes, I mean, I would say an acceptance of the, of the fact that it is a very fraught, contradictory, 
experience of, of life and that it isn't just the one way or the other way that, and that the, the, the notion of identity can be quite fragmented and, and, uh, and slippery and that this is the case for uh, so many, so very many people in the United States and throughout the world. Um, I, I, my sense of his character is that his, his experience of growing up does begin to shed some light on other ways of, of being and, and belonging to America uh, above and beyond those that seem more uh, predictable. Thank you. Luis, that tension. Um, does it exist for Nayeli in terms of the U.S. and Mexico, that, that dichotomy when, when we think of that role in the beautiful north? Yeah, I, I think so. I think it's inescapable. You know, one of, the, uh, one of the critics said I had invented a new genre, which was slapstick immigration, which I thought... That's, that's a great line. <laughs> yeah, slapstick immigration. Um, but, you know, I, I, I think part of, the, part of the tension, not only in Nayeli and every, every character, when you read the book, you realize, I think, quickly that every single character in the book on both sides of the border is in a kind of a yearning quest and a yearning search for all kinds of things, mostly, I think, just belonging and acceptance in general, um, including Border Patrol agents. And, uh, you know, Nayeli uh, goes through a kind of a Joseph Campbell for girls experience, right? It's, a, it's the young woman warrior's journey, and she starts out rather naive and innocent and dreamy and goes forth and slays endless dragons to get here. And I think it's you know, it's kind of a love song, I think, to to both countries and both cultures, and maybe a slightly subversive attempt on my part to have people consider and even root for folks that sometimes we look down on. That, thank you. Carlo, um, Nayeli and Maddie Ross seem to actually share some characteristics, and Maddie's adventure to avenge her father's death is um, not unlike Nayeli's quest to kind of bring everyone back home. I think there, there are some parallels there. Both girls recruit men to come to their rescue. However, neither Maddie nor Nayeli act like a damsel in distress. I wonder if you can speak to this surprising duality in this wonderful 14-year-old character that Mr. Portis has written. She's asking us for help, but she's never helpless. Right. I mean, she has to operate in the genre, you know. She has to. She 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 finds herself in a western, and the western is populated with violent men. So she has to she has to inhabit that world. But right, what you see a lot is her very shrewdly assessing men um, and figuring out what they can do for her and what they can't do for her, and when she needs to, you know, get rough with them, and when she needs to. Um, uh, perhaps uh, allow them to think that she's a damsel in distress, at least briefly, in order to gain advantage, right? Uh, but a lot of the book is exactly that, is her kind of shrewdly assessing um, the, the, the metal of the, of the men she encounters, including there's this great scene in which she um, uh, deals with a horse trader, a guy named Colonel Stonehill, where she has to get the price of, uh, she has to get her price from him, and they go back and forth, and he tells her, you know, she wants $325 for this horse. And he says, I would not give $325 for winged Pegasus, you know. And she slowly breaks him down and gets her price from him. I read True Grit to my daughters when they were little. And that scene has it became kind of a touchstone for them, you know, that a, that a young girl moving through the world forced to deal with these guys who are in positions of authority and power over her um, insists on getting her price. And, you know, she knows the ins and outs of the law, and she understands uh, – you know, uh, the leverage and psychology, and she she really um, she really ends up forcing all the men to react to her. And in fact, what happens when she goes off into the Indian Territory um, with the two men, Labeef and and Marshall Cogburn, is they end up competing for her approval um, as they as they go off on this quest. And what you see is this character sort of moving into the Western and, and taking it over, basically. Thank you. We have a question from Sherry Caldwell in Atlanta, Georgia, um, and I think each of you may be able to answer this. It has to do with 
your feelings about these books, these books you've either written or are representing here, um, being represented as movies. What, what did that feel like? How, how has that been as an experience for you, as, um, especially for the, for the two writers who've seen their work translated in that fashion? Jump. Should I, should yeah, I start? Yeah. yeah. Um, I would say that it gave me um, a glimpse, perhaps somewhat early, of what it may be like to be a grandparent, in that I felt very affectionate toward the film, um, very pleased and proud of it in a, in a way, and yet at the same time felt no responsibility toward it whatsoever. That, that's very and there healthy. was a very, <laughs> there was a lovely, liberating, you know, just detachment um, by the time the film was made. And I think partly it was just my, my general feeling toward any book or story, even after the fact of, of writing it, I feel you know, I just really sever the the bond with it, and I feel that it's practically practically been written by somebody else. It just sort of leaves me cold, um, which is helpful. And but it was also helpful that uh, in this case the book was received and uh, re reimagined uh, and re reinterpreted. By, by someone as wonderful as Mira Nair and, and that she was, she, when we spoke about the possibility of the book becoming a film, I saw that she was, she was on fire with something that, that no longer really meant anything to me. And I just thought, well, that's fantastic. And let's see what, where it takes her because I felt, I felt that she then had the, the creative urge and need to, to do something with, with the story, which I no longer had. And, and so it was really the best of, of both worlds. And, and, and when the film came out, I felt, uh, as I said, I was very pleased with it. Um, I was sort of fascinated by how something created solely through language can be uh, recast into um, a series of images, you know, a, a story really delivered through dialogue and and, and, and scenes and, and, and moments and color and sound and music and, and all of those things that, that go into film. So that was, you know, just from, from a sort of workmanship point of view and an interesting um, education. Um, but, but I just felt so, I just felt this sort of lovely, happy connection without any of the burden of, of, of really you know, when one creates something, at least for me, I feel, uh, I feel so fraught um, and responsible for it because it is my responsibility. Uh, whereas, you know, in this case, it, it was one step removed and I was very, you know, it was, it was ideal. I, I love the so notion that, that the really film cool. is the grandchild. Luis, if you had a cast Into the Beautiful North as a movie, who stars in it? <laughs> Oh Lord, um, you know that's a great question. I, I I have been involved in wrangling and maneuvering nonstop from movie people about the book, um, and at one point somebody made me this stunning offer that Aunt Irma, we could have Meryl Streep play her, and I thought, oh yeah, Meryl could do a Mexican accent. Um, you know, I I don't know the one character that of all of them. Uh, gets the most attention is this character at Tomiko, who uh, is amusing to me because he's the scariest guy in the book, but all the book club ladies love him to death, and they always say, oh, we just love that at Tomiko guy. And I always tell him, well, if he walked in your house, you wouldn't love him. <laughs> he would probably scare you. So for that role, you know, a young Edward James Olmos would have been perfect. I think in times, you know, when I was writing it, I was imagining him in that role back in his I love that. That's, that's perfect. <laughs> Carlo, uh, you spoke a little bit about John Wayne's True Grit, um, but there was also a more recent True Grit that the Cone Brothers did starring Jeff Bridges. 
How does Mr. Portis view these adaptations and how involved was he with the production or the screenplay of, of either? And just out of I curiosity. Would say, I would say uh, estranged grandparent. Uh, he, he, he just lets it go um, and has nothing to do with it. Um, and uh, so I, I, would, I, would, I would really respond as a, as a reader and say, of the novel and say that, you know, it's been a little saddled with the first adaptation. That is, John Wayne's performance is, you know, very memorable and all, but the movie's not a particularly good adaptation of the book because in order to get Portis right, you've got to get the language right. That's the most important thing, that people have to speak with the vocabulary of regular Americans, but as if they were in the King James Bible. You know, it has to be elevated and kind of mock epic. And, and actually, I thought the Coen brothers got it right, really got it right. And one of the ways you can tell they got it right is the lines they wrote that were not borrowed from the book, and many of the lines were borrowed from the book, um, were, could have been in the book. Um, uh, well, it's, it's, it's pretty seamless, isn't it? Well, so, you know, so when, when Maddie finally is captured by the bandits towards the end, she describes herself as having been captured by a Congress of louts, you know, which is a line that she could have said in the novel. And, and Rooster Cogburn says, I've been led astray by a harpy in trousers. And again, that's a line that you could have found in the novel. So they really paid attention. They did not remake the first one. They went back to the novel and adapted it. The other thing, of course, is that Haley Steinfeld was a, a fabulous uh, Maddie Ross and, and, and Kim Darby, who played her in the first movie, um, just you know, wasn't right for the part in the same way. So I, I really thought the second adaptation was, um, while clearly the Coen brothers' own movie uh, and, and not, you know, a slave to the book, um, took what sets Portis apart and what makes him really a distinctive writer, uh, took it and made it the centerpiece, which is to have these characters not only speak this elevated diction, but also be aware that they're doing it and be both kind of inflated by that knowledge and also worry that they were ridiculous. And, and all of them had such a good time chewing on those lines, including Matt Damon, who actually looked like he was literally chewing on those lines because uh, his tongue gets hurt in the movie. Um, so that, uh, so that uh, it, it, I think that the second one really, uh, for, for a lover of the book, I think the second one is, is the more interesting uh, adaptation. Thank you. And um, something for you each to chew on right now. I wonder if there's a novel or poet currently a part of our Big Read Library that you have a particular connection with. Jumpa, let me, let me throw this one to you first. Sure. Well, I, I've had strong connections to many of the books on the list. Um, I would say most recently, uh, both um, My Antonia and, uh, and The Grapes of Wrath, perhaps more recently The Grapes most recently, The Grapes of Wrath, which I had never read, much to my... Um, they didn't uh, assign it to you in high school? Not. No. not. They right. did not assign it to me in high school. It's just one of those... I mean, you know, you, they can't assign all the books you, you think you're supposed to have read in high school in high school. And that was one of the books, for whatever reason, my AP English teacher did not assign that book. Um, we spent six months reading Moby Dick, but, you know, which was perfectly fine. Um, in any case, I had never read it, and I read it last summer for the first time, and had, you know, just, I was utterly in its spell, had a very intense reaction to it, and, um, and I think, I hope in some way it helped me to, um, to finish the, the novel, um, my next novel that is, that I just, finished writing um, just a couple of months ago. Um, but, but just the sense of uh, place, the understanding of place, the, 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 the incredible complexity um, and love of, of, of the land um, and, di and the difficulty of, of confronting um, physical space and place and all of those things were just um, you know, I was just absolutely um, overwhelmed by by the novel, um, and then went on to read some more of Steinbeck's novels that also were gaping holes in my literary education. Um, so I would say that would be the, the one book that um, most recently made an impact, but but also very much um, my Antonia, and and then you know certainly the Great Gatsby stands as my model of a perfect, perfect novel, really, um, not a word wasted. Thank you.
Um, and that I did read in high right, school. Right, as we all <laughs> and, did, I think. And, and remains, and then again and again, as we all did. It, and, but remains just as fresh and true and and powerful as the first time I read it at the age of fifteen. Luis, I think I know what the answer, or at least one of the answers, could be in terms of um, the Big Read Library and you. But I I wonder if there might be a surprise here. Um, in terms of a book or poet you have a connection with, one that's not as obvious to those of us who know how much you've done for some of the books or one book in particular. <laughs> well, you know, I have to I have to say my my heart skips a happy beat when I hear you mention Ursula Le Guin, um, because Ursula, uh, you know, she's the one who started my career. <laughs> People that's don't know fantastic. that. That's fantastic. I had no Ursula, idea. Yes, sir, Ursula. Came into. Would, would, uh, can you elaborate on that? Was she? Yeah, your teacher yeah. She, or, ah. she came. She came to San Diego as a visiting famous author to our writing program. It was right after my father had died in awful circumstances in Mexico, and um, you know I did not know how to process my father's death except by my own homemade medication, was which was writing. And uh, Ursula discovered the piece I'd written about my father's death, and she not only taught me and took me into her workshop, but she published it in an anthology, and it became my first real sale I'd ever made. And that's that's fantastic. A, isn't that incredible? So, you were, know, you, Ursula, were you at SDSU? Did she come through there? I was at Where were uh, you? UCSD. Ah, UCSD, right. Yeah, and, uh, you know, I, I had the incredible privilege of, of attending a kind of an Ursula uh, homenaje, as they say in Spanish, in Bend, Oregon a few years ago, and uh, I read the piece, and I had found the actual mimeograph uh, master with her comments on it, so I read from it, and I dedicated it to her and said that would be the last reading I ever did of that piece. Yeah, it was, was it really that bad? <laughs> no, it was it, good, it was, but, uh, you know, it was time to move on. It was too painful a piece about... How many years August. between her putting that out and this event? Uh, she did the anthology. It came out in 1980, and this event was, you know, in the, in the aughts a couple of years ago. And, uh, right. you know, the great right. thing about Ursula is I sat down next to her, and she said, let me see that story, and I handed it to her, and she looked at it, and she said... It's still damn good, <laughs> which made me really happy. That's great. Yeah, it was awesome. So that's, that's also it's a nice little connect the dots for us here. We didn't know that. It's a tale, as I like to say, we can dine out on. So thank yeah, you. That's my little secret. It's great. Carlo, um, you and the Big Read, Big Read Library, do you have uh, special connections to any of the books on that list? I was just going to ask, is, is, is which Ursula Le Guin is in the Big Read? Which one of hers? Um, wi Wizard of Earthsea. It's the Wizard of Earthsea. Um, I was just thinking that I can tell you exactly where that book was shelved in my elementary school library. <laughs> and what wow, color the jacket was. Wow, because you took it off the and, shelf so many times? <laughs> because you took that? it off that shelf so many times to read? Yeah, you know, it's, it's funny, you know, in the, the, the pre-internet reader, think spatially, you know, oh, it's the yellow yeah. book, two shelves up from the green book. I haven't read the green one yet, but that one looks good. You know? um, as we are, I'm the newcomer here to the, to the Big Read, so I'm going to ask you a question first, and it's because Jumpa mentioned Moby Dick. Is that on your list? No, it's not, it's not. but maybe we can consider it. And the, uh, the reason I was going to mention it is just because that's a book, speaking of communities reading, where every time I teach it, you, uh, at least when I teach it, I sort of quail and think, it's going to be too much. You know, people aren't going to want it. You know, students. I've taught it to all kinds of students and all kinds of all kinds of groups of people, and you always think it's never going to work. They're just going to bog down. You know, and and never once have people failed to just rise to the occasion and find something in it. And uh, and you know, I always budget. Well, it's it's you know, certainly it's big weeks. enough to find something in. What's that? I say it's certainly big enough to find something in, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, but it's but it's also that. Um, Readers are remarkably game about that book. They think like, well, okay, you know, this is the big time. I better, I better bring my A game, you know. And and uh, and I always, you know, budget a big chunk of the semester for it. So if it doesn't work, it's just going to be a bomb. You know, it's going to be a total disaster. And uh, and so far, um, 
every time uh, my fellow readers in the classroom have found ways to make it their own and own it and fight back against the parts of it that they don't like and, and fight with each other and, and, and really become a community of readers, a community of inquiry all around this, this you know, difficult, huge, heaving book. Thank you. Um, and thank you all so much. This was just a, an absolutely lovely conversation. And thank you all for participating as authors and experts in, in our new big read program. Uh, for those of you in our audience who want more information, it's neabigread.org. And thank you all so much for signing on. Thanks, Aaron. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Okay, thank you. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.